Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Discovery Live Ask a Scientist. Once again, my name is Ben Gondras, and I'm the Dome Theater Manager at the Fort Collins Museum of Discovery, and it's my pleasure to get to host this program and bring these amazing experts that are right here in our own community to you to answer your questions. Um, as I've said before, we do rely on your support to continue to bring these types of programs to you. So if you do feel so inclined uh, and would like to help us continue to bring these programs to you, we do ask that you uh, consider making a donation to the museum. You can do that two different ways. If you're watching on Facebook, there should be a little donate button right down below the video. You can click that and make a donation of any size, or you can visit our website at fcmod.org donate to make that donation. Um, so, like I said, in this program, we bring the experts and the scientists to you so that you can ask them your burning science questions. And for tonight's program, we have some bird experts from the uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And uh, we're going to go ahead and welcome them onto the program now. So with us tonight, we have Aaron Youngbird. Welcome, Aaron. Hi. And, hey, and Matt Webb. Welcome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, hopefully this is a really fun discussion about birds um, and just about the work that you guys are doing to uh, help conserve birds here in uh, Fort Collins and uh, Colorado even, and maybe even beyond. Yeah. Um, so with that said, let's go ahead and start with some just brief introductions. Uh, if you could both just tell us a little bit about who you are, um, what it is that you do around birds and maybe a little bit about how you got to where you're at right now. Um, so Matt, why don't we kick it off with you? Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Matt Webb. I work for Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and my main work uh, as an avian ecologist there is uh, developing a network of automated radio telemetry stations. So stations that listen for tagged birds um, across the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, before this, I worked for the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where um, I was in charge of uh, answering lots of questions similar to this <laughs> in the section of birds and um, uh, working on studying some threats that birds face. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here again, Matt. Um, and Aaron, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Erin Youngberg, and I'm the community and outreach biologist at Brick Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, and I found my way there actually as a technician one summer studying grassland birds uh, and their nesting survival rates up at Soapstone Prairie, which is north of Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in 2010. So I have been there a little over 10 years. And now I lead the monitoring effort on city properties in all the natural areas to mm. monitor the bird populations. So every year we go and survey um, a subset of those natural areas. So we get a, a good feel for how the bird populations are doing in our natural areas, in our city, in our urban areas. Um, and as the outreach biologist, I also teach bird ID classes mm. and I lead bird walks and I work with students and I work at bird banding stations to explain to kids why we should be excited about birds so I'm really excited to be here tonight to answer your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, so why don't we start off, uh, if you guys could both just talk a little bit about the work that Bird Conservancy of the Rockies does and, and why that work is so important. Um, and whoever wants to kick it off, go for it. Sure. Um, well, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies um, has a mission to conserve birds and their habitats. And we do that uh, through a three-pronged approach of stewardship, science, and education. So we actually have a stewardship team of biologists that work with private landowners because a lot of the remaining quality habitat for birds is actually privately owned. So we work um, with private landowners to provide technical support. Um, we work with farm bill dollars to do improvements on their land that benefit both their ranching lifestyle and um, improve habitat for birds. And then we have an education department. We actually have, that's down in uh, Brighton in North Denver. Um, and we have our own outdoor education center. And uh, we, re we do outreach to homeschool kids and we get in class when we can get in class again programs to get kids excited because they're the next stewards of our natural resources and our wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and then our science department that Matt and I are both a part of 
does some research on bird populations, the research that uh, Matt and I are actually doing on grassland birds that he mentioned, uh, building those radio telemetry towers, we want to understand why grassland birds are declining faster than any other group of birds in North America. So we, uh, we are catching birds and putting tags on them. We're building these really cool radio tele telemetry stations um, and uh, lots of other grassland bird related things. So <laughs> I don't know, if, Matt, if you want to add anything about that. <laughs> It seems like you've covered pretty much all we do here at Bird Conservancy. <laughs> we, uh, we, we work, we work uh, throughout the, uh, the Western United States in uh, 11, I think 11 different states, all the way from Canada down into Mexico. Uh, right. We study the grassland birds on their wintering populations, uh, wintering grounds down in the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico. So we're an international organization in that way, even though we're based here in Fort Collins. Nice. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. I had no idea that your guys' uh, work had such a wide reach. Uh, that's, that's really amazing. Um, so Aaron, you mentioned the, the education center down in Brighton and I, I personally have been down to Bar Lake, um, to see the Eagles, uh, the bald yeah. Eagles when they've been there. And it's, it's just an amazing sight to see so many bald Eagles in, in one location. Um, can you talk a little bit about why Bar Lake is such an ideal place for these eagles to be um, and why they end up there um, in the springtime, I believe it is? Yeah, right. actually, um, eagles will be here year round. Um, okay. And oftentimes they will return to the same nest year after year unless mm -hmm. the nest falls down, like in this in a storm that just happened, something mm -hmm. like that, or if the tree falls down or Oftentimes they'll keep adding to the nest so that it's so large, it will actually fall out of the tree. <laughs> oh, wow. But, um, Bar Lake is a really, I think, a really special uh, natural area um, on the edge of an urban center. And so um, eagles like to fish, they eat fish, and they also will scavenge other things. But um, there's lots of uh, standing trees that are great for eagles to perch on and roost on. And mm -hmm. there's been a pair of eagles there ever since the early 80s. And yeah, they come year after year, they'll return. And the ones that hatch there will return and then they'll disperse to nearby areas. All the little lakes around the Front Range, um, you can often find a bald eagle nest nearby. Um, we monitor about between 50 and 60 bald eagle nests in the Front Range of Colorado every year. And actually right now they are incubating eggs. They'll be hatching oh, soon. Nice. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the the radio telemetry work. Can you um, just kind of describe what that looks like and, and how does that process work and how do we track um, those birds through that? Yeah, so radio telemetry is a technology that's been used to uh, track animals and their and learn about their movements since the 1950s. Um, you know, the most classic example is if you go up into the mountains and look for the elk around mm -hmm. Estes Park, you'll often see one wearing a collar, you know, a large kind of uh, thing attached to their neck. And that is a radio telemetry unit. Um, it's a transmitter that the biologists who are studying the movement of those elk will follow them around uh, with a with a handheld antenna. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have seen pictures of someone with an antenna over their head, you know, <laughs> looking for the, uh, the animal. Well, with, uh, with grassland birds and with, with birds in particular, um, radio telemetry has been used for all kinds of uh, research projects, but um, following them on their movement throughout you know, their entire migration is quite difficult because they move across continents. Um, and so what we're doing is we're, we're putting that same little radio tag on a bird but we're putting a, a station out in the landscape, places that we know birds move, move through. And we're building a whole network of these stations throughout uh, this region. And as these birds pass you know, within roughly 15 kilometers or so of that, that receiver station, a detection is logged at that station. And so um, it, it allows us to understand how birds use a landscape, how they move across an entire region on a large scale, and uh, allows us to research those, the, the movement of those birds without having to recapture the birds to collect the data. There's a lot of different kinds of uh, 
tags available that you can use to put on a bird to study their movements. Um, GPS tags are available, things, things like that. But a lot of those are too large for the grassland songbirds that we study here at Bird Conservancy. And uh, the ones that are small enough for the birds that we study, you actually have to recapture the bird and download the data off of that tag. Okay. And with something like a grassland bird where we're you know, catching a bird out in the middle of this gigantic expanse, um, <laughs> it's oftentimes near impossible to recapture that same bird over and over again. Um, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so it makes it really difficult to catch and you know, download the data off of some of those technologies. So this, this radio te telemetry technology we're using is part of a larger uh, worldwide system, a network called the MODIS Wildlife Tracking System. And um, it allows us to be able to study these birds as they move across a large landscape without having to recapture them. So, Excellent. <laughs> um, this is just a random question that I just popped into my head, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, do you guys use satellite data at all to study migrations of birds? I think we did do a few with uh, mountain plovers um, okay. because they're a larger bird. And yeah, mm -hmm. a tag like that was going to be larger. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what years those were done, but we were able to determine that where they migrated in southern Texas and northern Mexico and back. And even which populations that were tagged in Colorado went out to California to winter and versus which ones went down south to winter. So we found that really interesting that those two different populations were breeding um, in yeah. Colorado in South Park, Colorado. Very cool. Yeah, there is a, a system that's been developed out of Europe. I'm really having a hard time remembering the name of it right now. That's okay. <laughs> it's named after um, the legend of that guy who flew too close to the sun. What is that? Oh, oh. Icarus. Icarus, yeah. that's it. Yeah, it's yeah. called the Icarus Project. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember that right. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, this Icarus Project, there is uh, a receiver on the International Space Station. And so right. when you put these Icarus tags on a bird, that transmits the data to the space station and then back to the, rec to the uh, researchers. And so, you know, they can study the movement of those birds clear across the world. And they're studying, in Europe, they're studying the movement of cuckoos as they move from the southern tip of Africa all the way up into Europe uh, using that technology. And wow. that technology is always getting smaller. In fact, we might be um, incorporating that into some of the work that we do on some of the larger bodied birds just this year. So yeah, it's kind of exciting. Technology is always changing. New things are always uh, coming available for us to adapt and use for bird research. So yeah, yeah it's a cool thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, that's the, the most amazing part about technology to me is how it's helping us gain a greater understanding of, of the world around us. Um, yeah. Things that we couldn't see before, like you said, those populations going to different places and then coming back to Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we just we wouldn't have known that otherwise. So that's that's <laughs> yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, so speaking of migrations, can you guys talk about some of the populations that we might see? Uh, migrating through Colorado or through uh, Fort Collins even? Um, what what different species might we be looking for? Sure. Um, right now, and even just in the last couple of weeks, if you had looked up or heard weird noises in the sky, you might have seen really large flocks of the sandhill cranes moving north. Um, and they're going through, you know, ne the middle of Nebraska, famously. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do come through Colorado as well, um, down in Alamosa, uh, there's a really large area and there's a crane festival that happens down there every spring. Um, and then right now too, the mountain bluebirds are passing through. Okay. So um, even in a snowy day like this, you might be able to see some. Um, and then, yeah, just they're all starting to kind of move around a lot and move down into town. We have some spotted towies coming back. Um, the juncos are on their way out. And pretty soon I think we'll start seeing some chipping sparrows and other sparrow species come through. And then we'll have like uh, waves of warblers and other songbirds that will come through mm -hmm. in another month or so, you know, May, um, the end of April and into mm -hmm. May. So some of those birds and Matt, any other, probably a lot more birds. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was thinking, um, you know, a lot of the grassland birds are starting to move north now too. So okay. our grasslands are starting to fill back up with the birds that breed there, um, despite the weather that we've been having. So if you're, yeah. you're hiking in a place like um, Soapstone Prairie, 
you might hear you might begin to hear meadowlark starting to sing up there quite a bit um mm -hmm. and some of the other the other grassland birds that that breed in that area another really great place is out um oh why do i always remember <laughs> i forget the name right when i'm like on the spot uh there's a natural area just south of where hughes stadium used to be um, maxwell or pine ridge Pine Ridge, yeah, Pine Ridge. Pine Ridge, yeah. And that is another really great place to see a lot of these grassland birds as they, they move back in. The grasslands kind of within the the little bowl um, mm -hmm. over the over the little hill there below the, the reservoir is a really nice grassland. And um, things like meadowlarks and grasshopper sparrows even can be heard and uh, seen in that area. So some of those are starting to move through right now, too. Yeah, and in Pine Ridge, too, there's a little strip of trees and bushes right next to the north side of that little lake and mm -hmm. um, that can be what we call a migrant trap and it will attract um, little songbirds like warblers and things uh, that would not normally stay and breed here but are passing through on their way to Canada and so that can be an exciting place to maybe see a rare bird um, mm -hmm. in the coming months so when it clears up if you want to get your binoculars and head out there on the trail that goes around the lake I bet you'll see some pretty cool birds. Yeah, Excellent. and a really great resource to be able to see what has been seen recently is eBird. Yeah. Um, hmm. eBird.org is the website okay. that you can go to and you can browse around by location and look up um, our, our natural areas around Fort Collins and see what has been seen recently um, and, you know, find something that you might want to go out and see. So that's a nice resource. Yeah. Yeah, it is. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, that was going to be one of my questions is, okay. what do we find? <laughs> we find that info, but yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I think um, one question that a lot of people, especially in Fort Collins have is uh, Canadian geese. They're supposed to be a migratory bird, but they seem to stick around year round here. And I think, Aaron, uh, we've talked about this before, <laughs> but um, can you talk a little bit about the geese that we have here that seem to be permanent residence, if you will. <laughs> um, I can a little bit. I mean, I don't, I don't know a lot about, about them. Um, and they're Canada geese. <laughs> oh, um, sorry. No, sorry. it's so good. Uh, <laughs> I, I think probably a part of it is that we've, we've created um, habitat for them with mm -hmm. our monoculture lawns, you know, in our parks and um, golf courses and places like that, where they can constantly be grazing out there and pooping. And I know that that's part of the hassle. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the geese, yeah, they, they were a migratory species um, and mm -hmm. some of them still are, but we will have geese that stick around year round as long as they can continue to find open water or a place to graze uh, and a place to hang out. And then they'll just reproduce and stay. Um, Matt, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know any other details about that. Yeah, there was a, uh, there was a guy at CSU who, um, back in the, I think it was the 50s and 60s, who studied geese, and he um, he brought them here to Fort Collins and he did? Oh, raised wow. large groups of them here in Fort Collins. There and so go. one of the reasons that we have them here year round is because of him. I you can, love uh, it. Yeah, his name, he's, he kind of goes by Father Goose. So you can <laughs> Google Father Goose Fort Collins, and uh, his last name is Crawford. I was trying to uh, read something about him, but he released them back in the 1950s here, and oh, okay. uh, so some of the populations we have are, are uh, remnants of the, the geese that Father Goose brought to Fort Collins back in the 50s. Where did he bring them from? I, I, yeah, I don't know. I was trying to quickly <laughs> read some things about <laughs> it, but yeah, you can you can Google that and learn about it. Um, yeah, it's very Gertie interesting. Gertie Crawford, somebody said. <laughs> That's <laughs> rad. I did not That's know really that. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I have to look Yay, more trivia. Into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's Leslie from our local history archive. Of course she knows. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Father Goose instead of Mother Goose. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I just that. Sorry. <laughs> great. Uh, that's great. Well, yeah, that's that's an interesting piece of trivia that I don't think I knew before. So thank you for sharing that, Matt. Um, yeah, you're welcome. That's awesome. Um, so you talked a little bit about the decline in grassland birds. Um, and I think, uh, there was a die off event that happened last fall. Um, and I think it was with grassland birds. Is that correct? It was with lots of different kinds of birds. Lots yeah, of different aerial, birds. Okay. Yeah, aerial insectivores cool. were the hardest. Yeah. Okay. Mostly the birds that eat. Yeah. Insects. Okay. 
Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that event and what what uh, people are thinking caused that event? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was uh, it was a very interesting specific time for that to happen. Um, all of the aerial insectivores, so things like swallows and swifts um, that we have, we're, we have, is it four or five species of swallow that we have uh, in Colorado and um, two different species of swift. But those birds were all um, here at that time and it was an early snowstorm. It was an early kind of um, freeze. Mm -hmm. And what that did was it actually caused all of the insects that those birds uh, rely on to fall down to the ground and often, you know, perish, um, mm -hmm. which made it so that those birds didn't have a whole lot to eat at all. Um, birds like swallows and swifts and, um, well, quite a few different fly birds. They, yeah, flycatchers are another one. Mm -hmm. They rely entirely on insects as their, their source of food. And so when the insects are no longer, those birds um, are unable to you know, rely on seeds or anything else like other um, more omnivorous birds are. And since those birds were still here and hadn't moved south, um, because insects were still present, the uh, the quick immediate die off of all of the insects um, had a really detrimental effect mm -hmm. on those birds. And so in places like, well, even here in some of the natural areas, when I was birding, I would find a couple dead birds on the ground. Um, some swallows and some flycatchers. And all across the Front Range, going all the way down into New Mexico, there was uh, just a massive, massive die off of birds. People would be walking, picking up bag loads of them. Mm -hmm. And some researchers at a university and a museum in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, studied that. And they kind of pointed to that, that freeze and the die off of insects as one of the main factors in what happened. But we also had the fires going on at that same time. And so there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the detrimental effects that the smoke that was present um, all across the whole front range. You know, we had that mm -hmm. major Cameron Peak fire. Uh, if you remember, there was just plumes of smoke here. It was yeah. hard for us to be outside. You know, the yeah. birds also breathe oxygen. And so there was a lot of discussion about what kinds of uh, negative effects the smoke in the air might have had on the birds. but the main main cause was the die off of insects. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the, the scientists when they um, autopsied the birds found they had little to no fat, um, which mm -hmm. birds need to migrate. So usually they would gorge themselves on those right. insects before they would start heading south and they didn't have a chance to do that. So mm -hmm. they, they tried some birds tried to migrate south quickly, but yeah, yeah. without those reserves, they literally fell out of the sky with starvation. You know, oh, wow. and that's why that's why a lot of the die off was seen farther to the south of us. It's like those birds were trying to move, you know, okay. despite the fact that they hadn't filled up uh, how they would have. So mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so can you guys talk about some other threats to birds? Um, I think, uh, you know, one one of the. Mm, one of the beliefs out there is that things like uh, windmills are are dangerous to birds and other, you know, man-made structures and those types of things. Is that in fact true? Are you guys finding that to be true? Or and what other threats are there out there that that maybe we have caused um, and maybe we could do something about? Yeah, no, that's a really important question, Ben. Um, of course, all bird mortality that we know of um, that's man-made is because of, th of things that we have done and right. built. <laughs> um, so they're all a threat to birds. All of the structures that we build, whether they're buildings with windows or power lines or communication towers, um, they all pose a threat to birds. But uh, more and more research is done to try and determine which one is the greatest threat. And actually, mm -hmm. um, a paper that was put out in 2013 kind of synthesized all of that data and found that actually outdoor cats were the large mm. the largest threat to our birds they killed over three billion birds every year um and that's even more than collisions with cars collisions with power lines and windmills um were actually way way down on the list below windows and cars but um 
so those are something we can do something about, you know, to keep your cat inside. Um, if you can't keep it inside, then build a safe exclosure outside for it or train it to walk on a harness or there's um, pet strollers and like pet backpacks that I've seen. And I think it's time that we normalize that, you know, um, mm -hmm. extend that value to cats that we have for our dogs that we walk on leashes and have licenses for. Um, so that's one thing I think that we can easily do something about. And another is uh, windows um, on buildings. And it's actually not true that the tallest buildings with the most windows kill the most birds. It's honestly some of the shorter buildings as birds come into urban areas and then see maybe the reflection of vegetation on your window that think they can fly into it. So you can treat your windows with, um, with decals, with stickers, um, with with tape, with strings, there's all kinds of ways that you can make windows visible to birds because they can't see glass. And Matt knows a lot about <laughs> about birds uh, and glass. He was working up at Powder Mill in Pennsylvania where they had an actual mm -hmm. tunnel that they would mm -hmm. test different panes of glass and send a bird through and, to see um, which window, which piece of glass it would avoid or not. And there's a net, of course, that the bird never actually yeah, in, a, in a safe manner. <laughs> Very safe. <laughs> But um, those are those are the two biggies, and those are something that I think we absolutely can do something about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when it comes to the declines of things like grassland birds, um, mm -hmm. the biggest cause of those declines is is just habitat loss. So yeah, right. you know we have converted the vast majority of the grasslands throughout the United States into agriculture. And that simply just takes away the home for those grassland birds. They don't use agriculture or agricultural lands in the same same way that they would have the uh, native grasslands that are there. And one of the biggest threats um, currently is the decline in grasslands in the wintering range. So, yeah. you know, down in the Chihuahuan Desert of uh, Mexico and up into kind of southern United States, Arizona, New Mexico, and uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, those grasslands are really the only places that probably 80% of our grassland birds that, that uh, come throughout United States and Canada uh, that breed within this area, they use that small little section of grasslands that are found within the Chihuahuan Desert. And those are being converted to agriculture on a pretty um, staggering rate. And what that does is that causes uh, more and more declines in the in the populations because of that pinch point in the winter mm -hmm. so habitat loss is the biggest threat to grassland birds yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. well thank you that was great information uh aaron i do have to admit that i have walked my cat in a cat stroller uh, no! <laughs> nice. and i am trying to harness train him but he he's very <laughs> resistant to that so we'll see sure. we'll see how that works out but yeah, he does love being outside, but he's always under constant supervision. So Good. Yeah, he, ne he never gets to roam free. Well, the caddy um, is a really cool, um, a really I, yes. cool solution, I think. You know, yeah, like I we make a chicken need... coop and a dog run for our dogs. We can, I think yeah. we can do that for our cats. So, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, we've got another uh, question about man made uh, effects causing issues with bird migrations and and the question is specifically around increasing radio frequencies uh you know as we develop further we have more cell phone towers and uh you know different types of radio frequencies happening does that affect migratory birds in any way that you guys know of that's interesting i um i haven't read specifically about how radio frequencies um, affect birds but you know radio is essentially energy um, mm -hmm. You know, everything from light um, mm -hmm. all the way through radio, through radiation, that's all the same energy. Um, but one of the one of the pieces of energy that really does affect birds is light. Um, mm -hmm. I don't mean to pivot the question to talk about a different topic right. per se, but <laughs> um, birds migrate by using the light that they see. A lot of the birds um, a lot of the small songbirds migrate at night and they use the the stars to kind of navigate. Um, and when when more and more light is emanating from below, it it erases the view of the stars that they might have or can potentially even confuse them to think that they need to go down, you know, so a bright mm. city might uh, might 
increase them, uh, increase their likelihood that they would enter that city, you know, the bright lights emanating from that. And so light pollution is a, uh, a major, um, a major factor in declines in, uh, in birds and it affects their, their migration patterns quite a bit. I haven't read a lot about how radio itself um, yeah. affects birds, but I am interested. I'll, I'll look into that and I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple other audience questions going on here. Um, one of them says, uh, can you talk about the tree area at Grandview Cemetery on Mountain Avenue? Um, this person has been told it's a kind of well-known habitat for a variety of birds, especially owls. Yeah, I know there's a, that there's, area. there's a couple of people that bird that really regularly. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, <laughs> a lot of different species of trees. And I think um, there's a pair of, of great horned owls that have nested there for years and years. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, Matt, if you bird there, <laughs> tell us all about it. <laughs> well, it is an interesting place. I mean, cemeteries uh, throughout the West really are kind of bird hotspots. Um, mm -hmm. You talk to birders and they know where the cemeteries are. <laughs> and, you know, it may sound creepy that we're birding in cemeteries, but really <laughs> the fact that they are these these forested areas that, you know, have very little uh, structures that we've built underneath, you know, they've got mm -hmm. shrubs and trees and yeah, varied amount of different kinds of trees. So they, they attract lots of different kinds of insects. And, you know, oftentimes there's berries that birds wouldn't be able to find in other places growing in a cemetery. And so cemeteries really are just birding hotspots. Um, the cemetery here is well known as, uh, you know, Eastern, Eastern birds that we typically don't see here are often seen in the cemetery the warblers that are from out east or um, currently there's a yellow-bellied uh, sapsucker and that is a, a type of woodpecker that's uh, from out east we have a red red-breasted sapsucker here but this is the eastern variety and uh, yeah it, they're they're there because of the the habitat that is created in those kinds of places in other urban places you know we typically change that habitat over quite often whether it's our backyards or parks or something like that, you know, that is constantly kind of evolving. And like Aaron alluded to earlier, often contains those mono uh, crop grass, you know, the Kentucky bluegrass that we use as lawn. And that's not very attractive to birds. So cemeteries being so diverse uh, vegetationally are very attractive to birds. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> I have you to go, go to the cemetery out. sometime. There will be a lot of yeah. us with our binoculars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's a nice yeah. loop that goes all the way around. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. Um, speaking of great horned owls, I personally am kind of interested in them because I uh, recently moved to a new house. And uh, for a while, I could hear an owl hooting um, at night outside of my house. Cool. And then one morning, I was eating breakfast and I looked out the back door and there it was sitting on top of the fence. Cool. Um, so do do great horned owls, do they tend to nest in the same place for a long time? I, you, you mentioned the ones in the cemetery. Um, and how how do I increase my chances of getting to see that, that owl again? Because <laughs> yeah, it was so cool. That yeah, they are yeah. so cool, yeah. There They're was awesome. one calling um, out just outside my house the other night. He was perched uh -huh. up on the power pole across the street oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> um, i could hear him inside the house i was like yeah <laughs> but yeah they'll return to the same nest every year as well okay um with the same mate um if they're wow. you know still living <laughs> right. um i don't know i have to increase your chances i guess <laughs> <laughs> being still and quiet you know yeah um, that's often when we hear the owls and going out in the evening um, yeah you know as they get more active um and just listening, yeah, just listening as you walk around. You you might even be able to find where it is in your neighborhood that they'd nest, you know, um, if yeah. you just kind of are aware and, and look around. Right now is a great time to find it. They are nesting right now. Mm -hmm. And because we don't have a lot of leaves on the trees, it makes them easier to see. Um, True. <laughs> you know, as it gets kind of dusk time, you'll start seeing them sort of roosting a little bit, up, you know, above or kind of on the next tree to where their nest, it, nest site is. So you could kind of hone down where it is exactly. Um, seeing <laughs> yeah. Time, so. yeah. Yeah. Cool. 
We'll have to go out and uh, see if I can find it again. Go owling. <laughs> just release yeah, a bunch owling. of mice in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'll do that, but <laughs> <laughs> we feed birds uh, at bird feeders. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Well, we've got a couple other audience questions here. Uh, Leslie would like to know: Do you have any favorite books about birds, and not necessarily guides, but novels, nonfiction, memoirs, the, that type of thing? Ooh, um, I recently read *Refuge* by Terry Tempest Williams. And she mentions mm -hmm. a bunch of birds. It's specifically about the Great Salt Lake. Okay. Um, uh, so I would recommend that one. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. *Sand County Almanac* is always a good one by Aldo Leopold. Um, and then there is another one that I'd recommend called The Home Place. It's by um, a professor out of Clemson University named uh, J. Drew Lanham, L-A-N-H-A-M. He's a birder and an uh, uh, avian researcher at Clemson University, and both of those, uh, Sand County Almanac and Home mm -hmm. Place, are really great books. Cool. Might have to check those out myself. I'm looking for a new book right now, so... <laughs> Awesome. Uh, we've got another audience question. Can you describe the relationship bird conservancy work has with landowners and municipalities? Sure. I um, touched on it a little bit, but yeah, I talked yeah. about our stewardship department a little mm -hmm. bit earlier who works directly with landowners. And those are um, what we call private lands, wildlife biologists. And I'm not sure how many we have right now because it's been growing so much in the last couple of years. I think we have um, 11 or 12 private lands wildlife biologists throughout the West. So we have a position in Montana, in the Dakotas, in Nebraska, Wyoming, several in Colorado, um, one down in New Mexico now. And um, they work directly with private landowners to access um, like farm bill dollars to do improvements on their land or build stock tanks and make grazing plans, you know, that improve their ranch and create habitat for birds. So those biologists work directly with landowners there um, with municipalities, um, I may be the only biologist in Fort Collins uniquely working with the city of Fort Collins to do those surveys um, on the natural areas, but um, we're hoping to expand that down the front range to include all of Larimer County, work with Boulder County and Jefferson County to monitor the entire front range as contiguous habitat because it is, even though mm -hmm. it's managed by several different entities. And so there's interest there in um, managing that whole area and surveying it in a similar manner to benefit our front range birds. So that's, that's really exciting, but that's on the, in the future, I think. And then kind of on a larger scale with the science, science team, um, we work with municipalities and um, uh, different agencies throughout the different states that we work at, uh, work in uh, to, to get access and um, yeah working on uh, funding some of our projects and things like that with the different agencies that are uh, present throughout the, the locations that we work. That's right. And yeah, I want to mention that um, the city of Fort Collins and Larimer County um, are always looking for uh, parcels of land to purchase around the cities um, for conservation, mm -hmm. um, specifically for conservation. So it can't mm -hmm. be built upon. And um, those acquisitions are often used as matching funds for grants that we go for, for federal grants, because those grants require a ton of non-federal match. And so land acquisitions like that can really help um, for conservation of birds. And the city has provided millions and millions of dollars of match for, for bird conservation through the work that we do. Awesome. Yay, yeah, city really for calling. Yeah, I'm, yeah, really, yeah. I'm really grateful to live in a city that values conservation and open space like the city of Fort Collins does. Yeah. 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 And that, that relationship right there makes uh, Bird Conservancy, even though it is a relatively small organization in the uh, avian conservation world, that relationship with the city of Fort Collins and the fact that we have access to those lands as match dollars makes us very unique in the avian conservation world because we're able to access large, large amounts of uh, federal funding by using those match sources. Often even large organizations such as the museum that I used to work at in Pittsburgh uh, do not have access to those kinds of non-federal um, match funds, which makes it so that we can't access some of those federal dollars. So it's a really, really uh, exciting and um, great opportunity and relationship that Aaron has been able to work on quite a bit um, 
building with the city of Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're great. It's easy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 It is great to live in a place that just, that seems to care so much about the natural world and, uh, you know, everything from birds to black footed ferrets Mm -hmm. to bison. I mean, it's just, it's, it's really cool. It's really cool. So, um, awesome. Well, we have another question here and, uh, I was going to ask about this, but how does citizen science get incorporated into the plans to have large area surveys and will it be incorporated? Um, I wonder what they mean by large area surveys. Um, there's several citizen science programs that are nationwide. Um, yeah. the breeding bird survey, um, relies on people running the same route and it's very specific you know there's a protocol Mm -hmm. that you follow um for a certain amount of miles and matt probably knows more details about this than i do um but that data all goes back together um to the breeding bird lab is that right matt research center Mm -hmm. um yeah usgs united states geological survey and that's been going on um for over 60 years at least. And so that gives us the largest data set for our bird populations across the entire country. And there's, so there's a breeding bird survey obviously happens during the breeding season in a window. And then there's a similar one um, called the Christmas bird count that happens mm-hmm. across the country as well. And those are really large data sets. Yes. That rely on our, on citizen science. Yeah. yeah. And then birding, um, you know, I mentioned eBird earlier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. eBird is really becoming a data set in its own. Um, you know, birders will use eBird to keep track of the birds that we we see while we're birding in a site like Grandview Cemetery, and that information um, makes it back into a you know a large database uh, hosted at Cornell University in New York, and scientists use that information uh, coupled together with Christmas bird count and with uh, breeding bird atlas uh, data to understand populations over time. So eBird really is becoming another large uh, citizen science data force. So yeah. Excellent. Go out there and bird watch. Yeah. 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 (laughs) It looks like she was specifically talking about what you were talking about the from Fort Collins to Boulder um, doing that kind of study. Oh, in the natural areas, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think eBird honestly might be the best yeah. just bird watching and mm-hmm. writing down um, and documenting those those bird species that you see. Um, the way that I'm surveying ha- has a protocol as well. And so we're looking for very specific things related to the habitat covariates and maybe management um, things that they're that the cities or municipalities are doing. Um, mm-hmm. If they want to change the way they manage an area, then we go in before and after and see how that's changed the bird populations. So that's very specific. But um, I think what Matt's talking about with eBird, um, just kind of general bird watching, actually. Right. Just getting um, the data. Yeah, that yeah. can get into places I might not be going, you know, because I'm going to very specific areas. So, right. Yeah. right. And often some of those sources like eBird um, can um, show us where we might need to focus some of our efforts. You know, mm-hmm. um, eBird has shown us that some of our grassland birds move through the mountains during migration. You know, when, when birders are up at Cameron Peak and see grassland birds on the ground, you know, they they um, report them and take photos and put those on eBird. And that's something that, you know, scientists who are studying grassland bird movement would never go up to Cameron Peak to study, right. you know, the Cameron Pass to study grassland birds. But we, we right. had no idea, you know, that, that the birds would pass through the mountains in that kind of a way. So, um, mm-hmm. You know that data being available on eBird shows us where we might focus some of our efforts as well. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's the amazing power of citizen science, right? Is that it is, yeah. you get just so many more people um, gathering this data that it, it makes it that much of a fuller picture. So that's, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And we do have we do have some other citizen science projects at Bird Conservancy. I mentioned mm-hmm. the bald eagle watch that yeah. we have, and that relies solely on citizens. Um, each person kind of adopts a nest or two to spend several hours a week just observing how many eggs are laid, um, how many chicks hatch, how many chicks fledge, um, mm-hmm. things like that. How long do they stay when they arrive and leave every year? And so that's 100% citizen science driven data. And we share that with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So they have a good handle on our bald eagle population in the state. And then we're also in the city of Fort Collins, we have an eastern screech owl 
citizen science project. Um, and that measures the health of the Poudre River um, corridor because the eastern screech owl nesting there is an indicator of, of a healthy riparian habitat. So citizen science scientists can come and um, get their little data sheet and they get um, a little machine that, that calls the, the song of the eastern screech owl and they go out at dusk and you know push play and then they write down if they get any um, answers back from owls oh. and which points they were at. So that's 100% citizen science driven data as well. Awesome. There's lots of and, opportunities. <laughs> and uh, those those opportunities are on your guys' website, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And that's cool. uh, just birdconservancy.org. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it looks like we have another audience question. Would the old Hughes Stadium area, if it is approved as a conservation area, impact bird habitat? Yeah, I think it would create more bird habitat than was previously there with stadium mm -hmm. there, <laughs> especially because it's it's adjoined with Maxwell right there in Pine Ridge. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and if you can reseed it with natives, um, that would just expand more of that that habitat for birds to use right there. It'd be great. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, that that whole area, Pine Ridge, Maxwell, uh, going north, Reservoir Ridge, all of these. Um, natural areas that are right up against the mountains like that are extremely interesting and unique uh, places uh, within Larimer County, within Fort Collins. They have a very diverse uh, bird, like suite of birds that, that use those habitats. We get some of the mountain birds and some of the not so mountain birds. <laughs> well, you know, you can find those in those areas, but they also have some very diverse and in, in some cases very unique and threatened um, vegetation that yeah. is found within those same sites. Um, just south of the Hughes site, there is a, um, a population of a small plant that's only found in Larimer and Bold Boulder County, anywhere in, you know, it, nowhere else in the world. And it's called the oh, um, wow. uh, Bell's Twin Pod. And, <laughs> you know, plants like that are extremely important and extremely unique. And that's what makes those sites like that across the, the ridge, you know, that part that goes right up into the mountains. Uh, specifically unique and specifically important for conservation too. Yeah. Wow. And I just thought they were fun places to go hiking. <laughs> well, they are that too. <laughs> that yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what people can do to make their backyards uh, bird friendly. Um, I think native plants is one thing, bird mm -hmm. feeders, bird houses. Can you just Let's just go into that, get into that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one thing is, you know, bird feeders, uh, you feed birds so that you can see birds up close, you know, so mm -hmm. having at least one bird feeder in your yard will increase the chances of birds coming to your yard and you being able to mm -hmm. see them. Um, but when you have a bird feeder in your yard to keep it bird friendly, uh, you put that bird feeder as close as you can to your windows, which seems counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but if it's far away from your window and say a cooper's hawk or something else scares the birds as it flies through, those birds are likely to hit the window and either injure or kill themselves. When that feeder is right next to the, to the, to the window, you're able to see them. Uh, mm -hmm. But if something were to scare those birds off of the feeder, they are not able to build up enough speed to uh, collide with the window and injure or kill them. And when I'm talking about right next to your, your window, I'm saying within three feet. Okay. <laughs> so um, if you if you want to see the birds from your window, the closer, the better. Um, otherwise, you can put it, you know, kind of in a place out in your yard where there are no windows nearby or are no mm -hmm. windows within the path that they would be able to collide with. Um, yeah. Another great thing is to keep your cat indoors so that mm -hmm. <laughs> so that it makes it more friendly for for birds in your in your yard. Aaron, do you have some more bird friendly tips for backyards? Sure. And I give you a big <laughs> thumbs up for that. Yeah. If you're going to attract <laughs> birds to your yard, please keep your cat inside. Um, <laughs> yeah. Planting natives. Definitely. That's also in an area like this, um, more water wise, if you have native plants, um, it's a, yeah, just a better use of resources. Um, and just like a variety of vegetation and heights. Um, so some shrubs and some taller trees, and it's even okay if you have the space in your yard to leave like a brush pile 
um, and even dead leave dead standing wood if you can because there's a lot of cavity nesters like um, the nut hatches and the chickadees that will nest in there and they like that um, that creates habitat for birds as well um, yeah lots of flowering plants that might attract pollinators um, that also attract insects so you might get insectivores too just a big variety of vegetation that you can offer things that may grow seeds things that might grow ornamental berries so you, you'll get some cedar wax wings or you know some robins um, thrushes and things like that that come through your yard i think mm -hmm. Um, Wild Birds Unlimited is a really great resource here in town that um, have very knowledgeable people about what mm -hmm. kinds of things you should put in your feeders, you know, whether it's seed or suet or fruit or whatever you want, um, hummingbird feeders, things like that, to get the biggest variety of birds, I think. And if everybody, mm -hmm. if you can imagine everybody in town sort of planting some natives, um, how much that would increase habitat, uh, the footprint of habitat in this in the city would be pretty mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah, and some other some other kinds of things that you could do are um, decrease your uses of chemicals. So mm. the things that um, potentially would kill what you might consider pests, the insects in your yard, because those insects are food for things like birds. Um, yeah. And you know, in the fall, one of the great things I like to do is be lazy and don't rake my leaves <laughs> because <laughs> because all kinds of insects um you know and moths and all kinds of things use those leaves that are falling on the right. ground to uh overwinter and mm -hmm. so you know the moths will build a little cocoon or even even sometimes um as a caterpillar will survive just within the leaf litter and so if that is there you know they're able to stay below the the snow and survive throughout the the winter which insects in your yard increase the likelihood that birds will be in your yard too yummy excellent mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you you provide the meal they will come right they will Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> awesome you take away um, so their got... meals they won't come <laughs> yeah, right yeah yeah we've got a related question um is there a best practice to deal with a bird that is injured in your yard yeah um there there is a rehab center um that will take an injured bird. Oh. Unfortunately, it's over by uh, Longmont. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit of a drive. I think it's Greenbrier I Wildlife. I think, I think that's what it's called. Um, you can Google it um, with just that amount of information and probably find <laughs> it. Um, I think it's Greenbrier Wildlife Rehab. Um, and then there is a raptor center here in town um, mm -hmm. in Fort Collins, but they only take raptors. So um, mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Um, and of course, if it's a bird that maybe struck the window, but is still alive, um, if you can get it to a safe place, like put it in a box and just keep it quiet until it can maybe recover and then you can set it free again. That always works. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of any other tips for injured birds. Yeah, often, um, you know, the the number of, of birds killed by cats um, is is high and and ridiculous and kind of staggering to think of but often a lot of those birds are injured um mm -hmm. you know and and they're kind of picked up um opportunistically by a cat that might just be walking past so if there is an injured bird it's best not to just kind of leave it by itself or put it yeah. into a little bush or something like that it's best to keep it safe so keep it away from the possibility that a um, a passing animal you know and, and cats aren't the only ones that might um, opportunistically eat an injured animal. Deer will do that too. <laughs> we don't really think of deer as carnivores, but really they're <laughs> omnivores. You know, they'll they'll eat opportunistically. So, um, yeah, like Aaron said, putting an injured bird into a, a a box or a bag or something like that, and just kind of keeping it out of the sun and keeping it in a quiet place, and letting it sort of recover before you let it go, um, keeps it from uh, being opportunistically fed on. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And to pick up a bird, you know, you don't have to necessarily be concerned about leaving your scent on it or anything like that. Um, okay. You know, just just reach down and grab the bird in a in a calm and you know, in a manner that you're not smashing it or anything like that, and just quickly okay. stick it into the bag. You know, um, mm -hmm. they're pretty hardy animals too, so um, you know, you you shouldn't necessarily be able to just injure it by grabbing it off of the ground and putting it into a bag. But yeah. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. 
Uh, those are, yeah, great tips. Thank you. <laughs> um, so amazingly, we are almost at the end of our hour. We've got about four mm -hmm. minutes left. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you guys. Um, and I wanted to close out by just asking you what your favorite bird is and why. Oh, man. <laughs> It changes. I don't <laughs> yeah, I don't you, yeah. Well, what's your I'll favorite let you today? Think about it for a minute, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite bird is always the the grasshopper sparrow. Um, mm -hmm. It's a grassland bird, often you know called just a, a little brown bird. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's not very distinctive specifically unless you start looking at it closely. Um, it's really really tiny. It's you know four inches four inches long, found in grasslands. But the thing that I really like about it is its song um, and the fact that it is so, um, so uh, I don't know if gregarious is the right term, but it's so loud with its song. So it will, in a grassland, just kind of find a, a tall piece of grass, crawl up onto it, and that grass bends over just a tad because the bird's so small. And it just throws its head back and lets out this kind of buzzy trilly song that sounds like a grasshopper. <laughs> and I think that that's one of the most magnificent things to hear as I'm walking across a prairie. Uh, grasshopper sparrow songs are always one of my favorite things. So yeah, grasshopper sparrow is my favorite. Bird. <laughs> that's awesome. You yeah. definitely know you're in a good grassland when you yeah. hear that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, my favorite bird tends to change like the more mm -hmm. I, have experience with a certain species or um i don't know that day maybe spoke to me <laughs> but um you know i i have a special place in my heart for grassland birds as well and um not to be cheesy or anything but i really like the the lark bunting you know even though that's our state bird they're just a really mm -hmm. striking bird they're all black and white so they look like they're wearing this tuxedo out in the grasslands where most other birds are <laughs> this of brown color right and so right. um that's interesting to me and they form these giant flocks um when they're migrating through in the spring of up to even 200 individuals and so those flocks are really neat to watch and that's sort of a harbinger of spring for me like the lark buntings are here and oh my gosh mm -hmm. um i really enjoy seeing seeing them and they have a really neat skylarking song too they'll fly up really high get some elevation and then they'll sort of flutter down with this really cool warbly song um and they're just yeah they're really visible <laughs> and they're really pretty and uh, i really enjoy the lark bunting it's a good state Excellent. bird yeah, it, is. <laughs> it is i agree it is <laughs> awesome well we are at the end of our time together and i just want to thank both of you so much for joining us on the program this evening thanks um, for having as us I said before yeah it was a pleasure to chat with you and and learn about birds um, and, uh, yeah, I hope you guys have a good rest of your evening and we Thanks. will hopefully have you back sometime soon. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. See you guys. And for everyone else out there watching, thank you so much for joining us for another Discovery Live Ask a Scientist. And thank you for all of your amazing questions as well. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we do rely on your support to continue to create and distribute these programs to you. Um, so if you wouldn't mind uh, perhaps making a donation, uh, we appreciate any and all support that we can get to continue to bring these types of things to you in your homes during this time. Um, and don't forget to check out our Facebook page and our website for upcoming events. We are doing uh, these Discovery Live Ask a Scientist every other Wednesday. And on the uh, alternate Wednesdays, um, I'm going to be telling you about the night sky. So join me next Wednesday right here on Facebook Live or YouTube and learn about what you can find in the night sky. All right. Well, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for joining me and we will see you next time. Have a great night, everyone.